welcome you to this presentation on examination techniques related to DA10 taxation and I'm your presenter Jeff Tabanda. Uh, it is to be noted that the Zambia Institute of Chartered Accountants has regrettably noted that the performance of most of these candidates for the various ZIC accountancy program has generally been below average and to this end, it has come up with this presentation, with, with these presentations, with, an, with a view of ensuring that most of the students are given a chance of passing these exams at the reported time. This presentation is uh, divided in three parts. The first one is the approved DA taxation syllabus and the general competences which are required of each examination candidate. And secondly, the topics in which many students have exhibited lack of knowledge and difficulty in attempting examination questions. And thirdly, the examination answering technique for the areas where most of the candidates of DA10 taxation have exhibited lack of examination answering techniques. They approved the syllabus looks at the following areas. The role of taxation in Zambia, ethical issues in tax practice, administration of taxes, taxation of unincorporated businesses, taxation of income from employment, taxation of investment income, company income taxation, taxation of farming enterprises, property transfer tax, presumptive taxes, value added taxes, and customs and exercise. Now, without going into detail of each of these areas, we would like to go into the difficult areas which students have been having problems with. The difficult areas which have been of a problem to many students relate to basis periods, VAT computations, employment tax, capital allowances computations, and business profit computations. Now, when it comes to the basis periods, the difficult areas where most of the candidates had problems would include the actual meaning of a basis period and what a current year basis means, what a preceding year basis means, commencement rules, cessation rules, and change of accounting date rules. Now, when it comes to suggested examination techniques on basis periods, is that uh, students must know the difference between a basis period and the basis of assessment, and they must also be familiar with the basis period deadline they must know what a current year basis means, what a preceding year basis means. Current year basis, practical example, it will be given later, as well as the preceding year basis, practical example. And then the basis rules will include commencement rules, cessation rules, and change of accounting debt. Now, when it comes to basis period and basis of assessment, the distinction between the two is that a basis period is an accounting period whose profits are to be assessed in a particular tax year. For example, if, if, we, if we have got profits for 2020, we would like to see in which accounting period there will be tax, which is a basis period. On the other hand, the basis of assessment is the set of rules that guides us to how these accounting periods can be fitted for taxation purposes. 
And it is to be recalled that in Zambia, the taxi runs from 1st of January to 31st December each year. And the businesses are encouraged to prepare their accounts uh, from 1st of January to 31st December, although they can prepare accounts to a date of their choice. Now, the, the basis period deadline here is as shown uh, in the basis period deadline, which shows that from 1st of January to 31st March of each year, the basis period will be the preceding year basis. And from 1st of April to 31st December, the basis period will be current year basis. Now, what this means is that if you're going to be looking at the preceding year basis, it means that profits of this year will have, as an example, been uh, taxed in the preceding year. And when you look at the current year basis, it simply means that the profits of this of this accounting period will also be taxed in the same year. So that's the distinction between the two. Now this takes us to value added tax. When it comes to value added tax, normally it's a question of for candidates being asked to compute output VAT and input VAT. Output VAT here is simply the VAT on what is purchased or on some expenses, and the output VAT is tax on sales that have been made by the company. So these are the areas where some students, because of lack of knowledge, would not be able to discern the VAT that would be applicable either on purchases or on sales. Now, there are guidelines as, the, as to what amount of tax should be charged, depending on whether the question talks of inclusive tax arrangements or exclusive. When you talk of VAT inclusive uh, transactions, it means that the amount that is in front of you includes a 16%. And when you look at a VAT exclusive, it means that transaction hasn't got the tax in it yet. So this is where you find that if you're looking at tax inclusive amounts, which is where most of the students have got problems, you are saying that the amount that is in front of you has got a 16% in it, meaning that if you look at it in terms of the percentage, it means it is actually equal to 116%. So for examination purposes, for you to calculate the VAT that is inside there, you would have to calculate 16 over 116 times the amount that is in front of you. Now, this 16 over 116, you will note that in many textbooks, translates into 4 over 29, which is just a simplification of the 4 over the 116. We'll be looking at a simple example shortly on how this can affect students in real exam situations. Now, when it comes to presumptive taxes, candidates normally would be required to calculate, the, the, to calculate and account for turnover tax, which is applicable to those entities whose, whose turnover is less than 800,000 kwacha per year. And with the presumptive taxes, these are taxes which the transporters pay as opposed to turnover tax. Now, when it comes to property transfer tax, candidates would normally be required to explain the treatment of transfers of value and compute property transfer tax that is applicable. And when it comes to taxation of farming enterprises, candidates 
would be required to calculate taxable profits from farming and then compute income tax payable for on farming and fishing income. Now the idea here is that farming profits are taxed at the a concessional rate of 10% as opposed to 35% which companies would normally pay. Now, as we were saying, company income tax again here, candidates would be required to calculate company income tax payable and the, in some circumstances to explain how the tax would be paid. Now, one thing that needs to be mentioned here is that uh, when it comes to company taxation, there is a concession which is given by Zambia Revenue Authority for those companies that are listed on the Lusaka Stock Exchange, where there is a reduction of 2% from the normal tax rate. And also, there is a 5% reduction on the tax rate that is applicable if a particular company offers at least one third of its shares to indigenous Zambians. In other words, if they put local people subscribing for shares in a particular company. Now, when it comes to taxation of investment income, this would normally be aggregated to other income which is received by individuals. Of particular notes here is that uh, there's normally a withholding tax on some of the investment income, and some of the investment income will be subject to withholding tax, which will be regarded as a final. For example, when it comes to rental income. Now, when it comes to taxation of income from employment, candidates would be required to calculate income tax payable on all emoluments from employment. Now, when you talk of emoluments from employment, you are not only looking at a salary, you also look at housing allowances and some other taxable benefits like, such as medical allowances, school fees allowances, and so on. And the, and the, at the end of the day, all employment income is taxed under the pay as you earn system, where there's a graduated scale of tax rates, where, just as an example, in the current tax year 2020, the tax free amount is 3,300 per month or 39,600 for the, for the whole year. Now, when it comes to administration of taxes, Candidates are required to explain their administrative procedures for direct taxes, including maybe objections which may be made under appeals procedure. Now, over and above this, also, there are also ethical issues that should be of guidance to taxpayers. And in this regard, candidates will be required to identify ethical issues that arise in the process of performing tax work and they respond appropriately to any identified ethical issue. I will give one example here of an ethical issue of integrity, meaning that when, when in making tax returns, you, people must be seen to be giving nothing but the proper and correct information. Now, when it comes to role of taxation, I think this one is straightforward. We said it. the role of taxation here is really a government income source, source of government income. And the, the role played by taxation in the economy is straightforward. We can give examples of maybe bridges being built, roads, and so on. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the basis periods. As we say that the current year basis means that the tax year in which the accounting period ends is the tax year in which the resulting profits will be taxed. 
And the, this applies to all accounting periods ending anywhere between 1st of April and 31st December, as has been shown on the basis period number line. Uh, I would like to give a simple example here uh, of a company X, which has always prepared its financial statements to 31st December of each accounting year. And during the year ended 31st December 2019, its taxable profits amounted to 180,000. Now, a few observations can be made relating to this simple example here. These profits, they would be falling in the tax year 2019. Because the tax year, as we said earlier on, runs from 1st of January to 31st December. So the fact that these profits were for the year up to 31st December, it means that these profits fall in the tax year 2019. And now, because the end of the tax year of this particular company is between 1st April and 31st December, the current year basis will apply, meaning that the 180,000 will be charged to tax in 2019 tax year. That's the current year basis. Now, another example on a current year basis here is a case again of company X, which has always prepared its financial statements to 31st December, 31st, sorry, to 31st July of each accounting year. And during the year ended 31st July 2019, its taxable profits amounted to 180,000. Now, the observations which we can make here is that these profits fall in the tax year 2019. Because remember, we said the, the accounting year is supposed to be, unless otherwise, from 1st of January to 31st December. So these profits up to 31st July they fall in the tax year 2019. And now, because the end of the tax year is between 1st April and 31st December, the current year basis will apply. Hence, the 180,000 will be charged in the, to tax in 2019. Now, when it comes to preceding year basis, which we have already discussed here, preceding year basis means that the preceding tax year in which the accounting period ends is the tax year in which the resulting profits will be subjected to tax. And this applies to all accounting periods ending anywhere between 1st January and 31st March, as has already been alluded to on the base basis line date line. Now I'd like us to refer to some two examples here. Example one is again of company X, which has always prepares its financial statements to 31st January each accounting year. And during the year ended 31st January 2019, its taxable profits amounted to 180,000. Now, our observation here is that these profits, they do fall in the tax year 2019. Because we are looking at the uh, 31st, 31st January 2019. And because the end of the tax year is between 1st January and 31st March, the preceding year basis will apply. Hence, the 180,000 will be charged to tax in the preceding year, which is the 2018 tax year. Now, to give a second example on the preceding year basis, Company X has always prepared its financial statements to 31st March of each accounting year. And during year end, 31st March 2019, its taxable profits amounted to 180,000. Now our observations here, according to the, to the rules, these profits, they fall in the tax year 2019. 
And because the end of the tax year is between 1st January and 31st March, the preceding year basis will apply. Hence, the 180,000 will be charged to tax in 2018 tax year, which is the previous year. Now, this takes us to commencement rules. The rules here are that if the first accounting period is of 12 months or less, the current year basis and the preceding year basis will apply accordingly. Meaning that it depends on the end of the accounting period. If the end of the accounting period is from 1st January to 31st March, we are looking at preceding year basis. If the accounting period is ending between 1st of April and 31st December, we'll be looking at current year basis. Now, the first accounting period, if the first accounting period is made up of more than 12 months, in other words, somebody has started business and he prepares the accounts for, say, 15 months in the first year. Such an accounting period is going to be split into two periods. The first period having less than 12 months, and the second one having exactly 12 months, which will be assessed on a current year basis or preceding year basis accordingly. This is in line with the basis deadline that we discussed earlier. Now, I'd like to look at a simple example here on commencement rules. Let's suppose that the first accounting period of Mr. X was for four months, ending 31st January 2017. Thereafter, Mr. X prepared accounts for years, ending 31st January. The tax adjusted profits for the first four years were as follows, supposedly. The first four months ending 31st January, 36,200. The next 12 months, 65,450. The next 12 months to 31st January, 82,700. And the next 12 months ending 31st January, 2020, 94,530. In this scenario, the taxable amounts in each of the relevant tax years are as shown uh, below. Now, the first four months to 31st January 2017, which is 36,200, is in tax year 2017. Therefore, because we are using the commencement rules here, we are saying the tax year for the first four months will be in 2016. You might be wondering why 2016 when these profits up to 31st January 2017. This is because the basis that we're looking at here is a preceding year basis. Because these profits, we are looking at profits which are falling between 1st of January and 31st March. Now the next 12 months to 31st January 2018, which is 65,450, is the in tax year is going to be taxed in 2017. Now the question is, why should profits which were earned in 2018 be taxed in 2017 instead of 2018? We are saying this is because we are using the, the preceding year basis here, which says that if the accounts fall anywhere between 1st of January and 31st March, their basis will be preceding year basis. This is why profits of 2018 here are, all, are, are being taxed in 2017. Again, when you look at the 12 months to 31st January 2019 or 82,700, the tax year that where this will be charged is 2018, although the profits are for 2019, but they are going to the previous year. Because again, we are looking at the preceding year basis. Now, this takes us to commencement rules example number two. We are assuming here that the first accounting period of Mr. X was uh, for 15 months, ending 31st July 2017. 
Thereafter, Mr. X prepared accounts for years ending 31st July, meaning that it is 12 months, 12 months now. But the first period was for 15 months. The tax adjusted profits for the first four years were as follows, we are assuming here. The first 15 months ending 31st July, 100,360. The next 12 months ending 31st July 2018, 75,450. The next 12 months ending 31st July 92. And the last 12 months, or the next 12 months, 97,220. Now, we are saying in this scenario, the taxable amounts in each of the relevant years will be as follows. The first accounting periods, which was for 15 months, is going to be split into two periods. One having less than three months, and the next one having 12 months. As you can see, the three months is the, the period of less than 12 months. And then the 12 months comes after that. So that profit for the 15 months has been split into two. So the idea is that the first three months will be taxed in 2016 on a current year basis because the 31st July 2016 is the, falls between first, I mean, falls between 1st of July and 31st December. And then the next 12 months, which is the, the 80,288, again will be taxed in 2017, although we are saying uh, these profits are 2017, and because it's a current year basis, they must be taxed in the same year. The next 12 months goes up to 31st July, which is ideally falling in tax year 2018, and because of 31st July, which falls into between 1st July and 31st December, the basis that will apply is current year basis. And this applies to the next uh, two periods, as you can see. It's all current year basis because the period is ending somewhere between 1st of January and, sorry, 1st of July and 31st of December. Now, this takes us to cessation rules. Now, this applies to a case where uh, a company is winding out. So I say when a company is winding out, what are rules that will guide us as to how the profits will be taxed? Now here, it says if the last accounting period is of less than 12 months, let's say six months, the profits of that period are going to be assessed in the period following the one that had 12 months. So in other words, you had a 12 months period, which this company had, and then it, within the next six months, it closed business. So we're saying these profits, when are they going to be taxed? You're just going to tax them in the tax year following the one that had 12 months. Now, if the last accounting period is of exactly 12 months, then the normal current or preceding year basis will apply. In other words, if the accounting period of this particular company was ending anywhere between 1st of January and 31st March, it means the preceding year basis will apply. And if the, the accounting period was ending anywhere between 1st of July and 31st December, the preceding year basis will apply, like we have seen earlier. Now, if the last accounting period is more than 12 months, let's say it is 18 months, such a period is going to be broken into two periods. The first one having 12 months, and the second one having less than 12 months. And the period which is, will be having 12 months is going to be assessed using the normal rules. The normal rules here meaning either the current year basis or the preceding year basis, depending on the end of the accounting period, as has been alluded to on the basis deadline. And the period having less than 12 months will be assessed in the tax following 
the one with the 12 months. Now, this takes us to VAT computation difficulties with uh, difficulties. Now, it has been noted uh, that candidates, most of the candidates, have had a difficulty in computation of VAT in relation to the following items. Uh, the distinction between standard, zero, and exempt supplies and their tax implications, VAT inclusive and exclusive amounts, VAT treatment of diesel and petrol, VAT treatment of airtime, a VAT treatment on overheads, VAT treatment of entertainment expenses, and VAT return presentation in examinations. Now, when it comes to overheads, the VAT that is claimed is uh, by a simple formula that looks at a proportion of the overheads that will be subjected to VAT. And this will be the taxable supplies as related to the total supplies. And then you calculate the VAT, which could be inclusive or exclusive. Now, you will note that most of the uh, items on VAT, they are there listed that if it comes to diesel, you need only 90% claim. If it's petrol, you don't claim any. So it's a question of learning. Students are advised to learn uh, those aspects. Now, when it comes to uh, entertainment expenses, as an example, VAT is only claimable on entertainment of staff members, meaning that no VAT is claimable on entertainment of customers and suppliers. This is a rule. It might sound as if, as if it's strange that entertaining customers and suppliers, but this is a rule. Now, when it comes to the VAT return itself, uh, what has happened in the exams is that the person will come in with so different items, some which would be uh, VAT, uh, VAT output items or VAT input items. The tendency has been for most of the candidates to worry about one aspect first of the VAT return, meaning maybe they just concentrate on the sales first and hold on to the purchases. Our advice is that for time management uh, aspect, as you read the question on VAT, be indicating whether the output, the, I mean the VAT involved is output or the VAT is input. And this you can do if you, if you prepare your VAT return side by side, as will be seen in the following example. Uh, in this example, there's a, a Methus, a person, a supplier of second-hand electro, electronic goods, who is registered for VAT purposes. Please let me mention that you cannot claim VAT if you are not registered for VAT. In other words, we all we know that we suffer VAT charges when you go and buy things in the shops. You can only claim that VAT if you are registered for value added tax, and there are formalities for that. Now, during the month of October 2018, Matthews made sales revenue amounting to 103,600. Included in this figure are exempt supplies amounting to 15% of the total sales value. The remainder are all standard rated supplies. And the following are purchases and expenses incurred during the month. So you can see in this example here, in this preamble, you're looking at the sales which were made. In addition to that, you've got expenses and the purchases coming in later. Now with the sales here, we know that uh, the, it is only standard rated supplies that will be 
uh, and liable to VAT, so to say, claim. Now, if we go to the next page here, 15 of the purchases are exempt supplies, so to say, and the remainder of the purchases are all standard ready supplies. And the question was saying that unless stated otherwise, all the figures were exclusive of VAT, meaning that VAT had not been added. It could have been a different case if they had said inclusive. Inclusive means the amounts that you are seeing, they have got a VAT element in them. This put an implication on how you can calculate VAT at the end of the day. Now, this question required uh, a computation of value tax, value added tax payable by uh, Matthews for the month of October 2018, uh, clearly showing whether VAT is chargeable or claimable on each of the above items. Now, this question went to length to also test the exempt supplies and probably zero supplies, although there is no case like that in this exam. Take your career prospects to the next level with Zika. Our diploma in accountancy is an essential qualification if you're planning on entering the accounting profession. The Zika tax program at both certificate and diploma level equips you with an enhanced understanding of the field of taxation. Our diploma in public sector financial management is ideal for accountants or trainee accountants working in the public sector. And CA Zambia, a respected designation designed to ensure that graduates are highly trained to hold senior positions in the workplace. You can study through flexible options like self-study as well as part-time or full-time through our accredited tuition providers. Zika sponsors the top CA Zambia graduate to the One Young World Summit for Young Leaders and also offers scholarships to the top university accountancy graduates from recognized universities. Visit zika.co.zm now for more information or find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. Don't delay. Your future awaits. Now, when we go to the VAT computation, uh, computation example solution here. Because the question has said you must show whether tax is applicable or not in all the items, you find that we are starting with exempt sales of 103,060, which they said was 15%, and there's no VAT involved there because it is exempt. Now, the standard sales were 113600 and it was 85% of that, having removed 15 exempt. And the, because these amounts were said to be exclusive, you calculate 16, 16%, which is 0.16, and that gave us an output VAT of 15,450. Now, the next one is on purchases. Exempt purchases were 68,000. Uh, 160 times 15%. And as I said, because the question has re had request, required us to actually show whether any VAT would be applicable or not, so for the exempt purchases there, there would be no VAT. But on the standard rated purchases, which was 85% of the total purchase amount, there's a 16% which had to be accounted for there. And now when it comes to overheads of 12,902, because that amount was said to be inclusive, you calculate 16 over 116 of that times 85% because overheads were 85%. And when it comes to entertainments, as I said, because the question said you must show the effect, there was no VAT there, so sure you just put a dash. On the motor van, there's a 16 over 116 because the amount that we were seeing was said to be inclusive. This is what translates to 4 over 29 in your textbooks. But it is really 16 over 116. And with the diesel, you can only claim VAT on 90% of the purchases. And because it was inclusive, you are looking at gain 4 over 29 or 16 over 116 to get your 720. And then you see, if you compare your output VAT to the input VAT, there's a difference there of 1663, which is the VAT which will be refunded to Matthews. 
So you can see the beauty about presenting your VAT return in exams in this way is that as you go through the question, you don't need to deal with output VAT first, then come and deal with input. As you read the question, be slotting. If it's output VAT, slot it down. If it's input, until you get down. That's for time management purposes. Otherwise, the answers would be the same if you had to first deal with output VAT and then later on come and deal with the input VAT. Now, this takes us to employment tax. The major problem with employment tax is that the candidates fail to appreciate that. If the question says somebody worked only for nine months in a year, all the, the emoluments, which would include salaries and other allowances, you must account for only nine months, not 12 months, just because it is a 12 month. You look at the number of months in which somebody was working. Now, I'd like us to look at a simple example here of a tax computation related to employment in an exam situation where we are looking at a past, this is a past exam question here, of Vini Katebe, a married person, Duprecious Manza, who was an employee of LP Fisheries Limited. And Mrs. Katebe was employed on 1st April 2018 as a marketing manager at an annual salary of 241,000. Other conditions of service provided for the following. Housing allowance per annum, 6250. That's per annum. Transport allowance per annum, 24100. School children's allowance per child per annum, 2000. Now, it says Mr. Katebe has two school going children. On 1st May 2018, he received a Labor Day award as the most hardworking employee comprising of 5,800 in cash and then 14,700 in the form of an upright, upright fridge. On the 1st of October 2018, LP Fisheries Limited declared a bonus for employees for meeting the performance target for the third quarter of 2018. Mr. Katebe's bonus amounted to 12,000 watt. In addition to his empl employment income, Mr. Katebe received bank deposit interest of 5960 gross. Now, when we say gross here, it means that no withholding tax had been effected yet in that amount. We know that when you get investment income, 15% withholding tax will have been levied on that. And then he received also royalties of 29,750. And he says net. When he says net here, it means that the withholding tax of 15% had been deducted. Withholding tax had been deducted at source where applicable. And that just alludes what I've just said. Now, when you go to uh, the next page here, you say during the tax year 2018, Mr. Katebe paid his children's school fees amounting to 5,700, subscription to the Institute of Marketing of, of 12, 2010, donation to local approved public benefit organization of 1,700, and income tax deducted under pay as you earn amounted to 70,252. And Mr. Katebe contributed to NAPSA a 5% of his basic salary as per legislation. Now, when it came to Mrs. Precious Manza Katebe, uh, she had been in business for many years as a retailer who was preparing her accounts annually to 31st December each year. And the net profit as per statement of profit or loss for the year ended 31st December 2018 amounted to 213,250. This profit was from a turnover of 800, 800, 817,900. Now, let me just explain here. The 817,900 here has got a significance in the sense that 
if the amount had been less than 800,000, Mrs. Katebe would have been subjected to turnover tax, not the income tax. Now, the net profit figure was arrived at after deducting the following expenses. There was depreciation of non-current assets amounting to 11,750. Motor vehicle expenses, 15,000. Motor vehicle expenses were incurred in respect of Mrs. Katebe's privately owned motor car van, which is used for both business and private purposes. Now, you see, this is important because when you are claiming, when you are claiming the expenses against your income, it is only business-related expenses which will apply, which apply. And it says here, it has been agreed with the Commissioner General that the business use of the motor van was 40%, meaning that it is only 40% of the motor vehicle running expenses which would be charged against the profits for Mrs. Katebe. Now, general expenses um, amounted to 15,000, I mean 157,000, and included 32,000 for repairs to a newly acquired non-current asset in order to put them in a usable state. Now, you see, let me explain what this means here. Uh, an expense that is incurred to renew an asset which has just been bought will not be treated as an expense. It will be of a capital nature, so it will not be allowed for tax purposes. Now, the next item that comes in in this case study is that there was an increase in general provision for irre irrecoverable debt amounting to 17,000. Now, let me explain again here the provision aspect here. According to the rules, a general provision for a bad debt is not allowable for tax purposes. However, something that is specific would be allowed. In other words, if you know a particular person whom you think will not be able to pay you, you, you got a specific provision to talk about, and it's allowable for tax purposes. But if you're just looking at a general situation where you're saying, okay, I think everything being equal, some people may not pay, and I think maybe it will be uh, 10,000. That is a general provision. It's not allowed for tax purposes. Now, this case study here goes on to say that salaries and wages amounting to 74,000 kwacha included the nominal salary for Mrs. Katebe of 28,600. Now, you see, there's a, a tax implication here of the salary that is made available to the owner of the business. It is not considered to be an expense. It is considered to be an appropriation. Appropriation meaning if somebody is like getting back some of the profits in form of dividends, so to say. And her niece's salary amounting to 25,000. Now, in relation to the salary of the niece, it says other employees on the same position as her niece are paid a salary of 18,000 each. Now, you see, in all fairness, that is in terms of the tax legislation now, in this scenario there, if other people in the company are getting 18,000, doing the same job, but this niece of the owner of the business getting 25,000, it means she's being she's benefiting unduly, so to say. So you find that in tax legislation law, the extra amount which this niece is getting is not going to be allowed for tax purposes. That's the implication. And it says the balance of the salary and wages are, are, for, are for all the other employees. And the other information that was given here is that capital allowances on qualifying assets include the motor van, which has been given, had been agreed at 62,100. Now, we all know what capital allowances is. According to tax legislation, depreciation, which you provide for yourself, only 
non-current assets is not allowable for tax purposes. But instead, you get it, what, is cap, what is called capped allowances. And there's a, normally a prescribed schedule as to how much capital allowances one would be getting for what type of asset. Now, the requirement in this question was uh, to calculate the income tax payable by Mr. Katebe for the tax year 2018. Now, if you look at our situation here, as far as Mr. Katebe is concerned, he only worked for nine months in the tax year. And this is crucial when you do uh, tax computation on employment, the time period. This person worked only for nine months. So whatever you're going to be taxing here must be for nine months. You can see the salary is 241 times nine months. Housing allowance times nine months. Transport allowance times nine months. However, with the school children allowance here, because there were two students, I mean two children, it means each of them was getting 2,000 allowance times two, that's 4,000. But then because he had only worked for nine months, you chop that to nine months, so to say. Now, with the bonus, it's a bit different because bonus is not a question of saying that he got this bonus because he worked for nine months or 12 months. It's a bonus that was given for him being in the company. So all the bonus is taxable. Now, you see, in employment tax computations, you aggregate all employment income first, and then if there are other income, like investment income, you bring it later. And what you bring there must be the gross amount. Because you see, this gross amount, it means now, it is going to be subjected to tax as if it has not been taxed. That's what it means. Now, when you go now to some allowable expenses, a subscription to a profession that is necessary to the employment of the, uh, the person is allowable for tax purposes. And the donation of a public benefit is an allowable expenses. In other words, before you calculate the tax for this person, you need to deduct these allowable expenses. This is why our taxable income here is ending up at 29303. Now, when you go to the tax computation, you'll be given tax bans, which apply for every tax year. And it says, the first 39,600 of whatever you get per annum is the tax free. This is the one I alluded to earlier on that it, it will be 3,300 if you're looking at a monthly salary, but this is per year. And the next 9,600 is taxed at 25%. And the next 25,200 is taxed at 30%. And any balance that remains falls into the higher tax ban, which is 37.5%. Now, you see, this relates to tax year, tax year 2019. Our tax rates change from year to year. So whatever rates will be applied will be depending on the rates that are applicable. But these are the rates which were applicable when uh, uh, Mr. Katebe was working. Now, once you've calculated the income tax liability for this person using the tax bands, you deduct any tax that was suffered at source. For example, Mr. Katebe had paid a pay as you earn of 7252. You subtract that. Otherwise, you'll be doing double taxation here. The withholding tax on royalties. Royalties as an investment income is subjected to withholding tax of 15%. So that tax that you suffered at the source must be deducted here because this royalty has now been taxed using the tax ban. Otherwise, it would amount to double taxation. And then once you've removed your uh, taxes, which have been suffered at source, you arrive at income that is taxable. I mean, that is payable for the year. Now, this takes us to capital allowances computation as another area where 
most of the students, almost on all exams, almost, they've got problems. Candidates here, they've got a problem in that they fail to calculate the capital allowances, which is always calculated on the cost of the item. So if I've got a motor vehicle that is the tax allowable, so to say, in terms of capital allowances for 40,000, uh, I will have to calculate a capital allowance up to the time when the capital allowances are exhausted on the cost. And then when it comes to ITV, ITV we know is income tax written value. Uh, calculation of the capital allowances is limited by the ITV. In other words, you cannot claim more than what is available for you to claim. And the claimable capital allowances are subjected to private use adjustment in an incorporated business. In other words, if it is a company, there's no private use adjustment. What it means here is that if I am an, an, an incorporated company and the, I am claiming capital allowances, which I use privately, that private use adjustment will be adjusted. In other words, I will not be able to get capital allowances for the private use which I made. Now, the other problem that comes in is a case where people fail to realize that the disposal proceeds which are taken into account when doing the capital allowance computation are limited to the original cost. In other words, if I purchase an asset for 10000 and then I'm entitled to a capital allowance, a capital allowance of, say, 25%, it means each year I'll be getting 2500 so to say, capital allowances. Now, if I happen to sell this asset, let's say, in the third year before I exhaust my capital allowances, it means it depends on the amount which I'm going to get. If I get, let's say, uh, 40,000 for this, they say the amount that you're going to account for in your computation will be restricted to the original cost. In other words, you cannot claim, you cannot include a disposal proceed which is more than the original cost. Most of the students have got problems here. And then, you see, because of this, a capital allowances computation schedule is being suggested in this presentation, as we'll be seeing now. Now, it is suggested that a capital allowances schedule should be constructed so as to accommodate all possible eventualities by incorporating the following elements in your tax computation schedule. One, you need to show the date of purchase which will assist in determining any ITV which may be brought forward if your asset was bought in the previous years. And you must give a description of the asset. You see, the capital allowances go according to the type of asset. So if you don't know what type of asset is in front of you, how are you going to possibly pick the proper capital allowance rate? And then you need the capital allowances rate, which will be given in the tax tables. And as I said, this will depend on the description of the asset that you will have given. And then you need the cost. You need the cost because capital allowances are always calculated on the cost of the asset. And then you need the ITV brought forward. ITV brought forward means the capital allowances that you have not exhausted from the previous period. This is important because you cannot claim allowances more than the ITV that is being brought forward. In another words, or in another case, if you don't have any, any ITV, there's no way you can calculate capital allowances. It means you have exhausted your allowances. And then, as I had said earlier on, the disposal proceeds must be restricted to the original cost. 
and then capital allowances and charges which will be restricted to business use in an incorporated businesses must be shown. And then lastly, you end up with it and ITV, which is being carried forward. Now, having said that, uh, there's a practical example here on capital lands compensation relating to tax year ending 2019, where company X had the following and current asset transactions. There's an asset there, date of purchase, its cost, and then disposal proceeds. What it means here with the first asset, it means that in 2019, this motor car, which had been bought in 2017, was sold for 40,000. So we're saying, how do we present this in a tax computation schedule, which we're suggesting today? Now, I've got here a computation schedule, which you will note that is going to incorporate all the items that I've mentioned. It has got a date of the purchase of the asset, the description of the asset, the capital allowances rate, the cost, the ITV brought forward, disposal proceeds, capital allowances and charges, ITV current forward. Now the capital allowances and charges here, you are, you are looking at the capital allowances per se and any, any capital charges which might, might be applicable when you sell the asset. Now, if you look at the building here, we're saying this building was bought on 25th February, 2016. And it's a building, industrial building. So we're saying if it's an industrial building, which was bought in 2016, and now we are looking at 2019, this is three years ago. It means you are only entitled to a writing down allowance of 5%. Because in the initial year of purchase, you could have claimed the initial allowance, the investment allowance, plus the writing down allowance. But this one is continuing now, it's a writing down allowance 5%. The cost is 275, the ITV is 178,000. Meaning that out of the 275,000, you still got to claim capital allowances amount to 178,750 if this asset still remains with you. There's no disposal there, it was not sold. So the capital allowance, you just calculate 5% of your 275,000 because you see capital allowances is always calculated on the cost. So 5% of 275,000, which is 18,750. Now, if you deduct your 18, sorry, 13,750 from 178,750, it gives you an ITV to carry forward of 165, meaning that you are still going to be claiming more capital allowances in the future. Now, when it comes to the motor vehicle, which was bought in 2017, at 35,000, the capital allowance for a motor car is 20%. That we know, it will be shown in the tables. And in the ITV we are, showing, we are given here is 21,000. Meaning that you are still able to claim capital allowances amounting to 21,000. But because this, this, this motor vehicle has now been sold, you will bring in the disposal proceeds so that you can compare to the ITV that you got. If your disposal proceed is more, then the ITV, which is what you're entitled to claim, it means you'll be charged. In other words, this will reduce the capital allowances at the end of the day. Now, this disposal proceed here is being restricted to 35,000 because the disposal proceeds were more than the original cost. In other words, if the disposal proceeds here was, let's say, 70, you wouldn't put 70 there. You must put 35 because the disposal process, the money that you got to sell the asset is restricted to the original cost. Now, this takes us to the furniture, which was bought in 2018, one year ago. The capital allowance rate we know from the tables will be 25%. You calculate on uh, cost 25%, which is uh, supposed to be 1250. You still got 3750 there to claim, and you are just going to claim 1250 because that's 25% of 5,000. 
that leave you a night TV or so much. And then lastly, the motor van that you bought in 2019, which is this year, it means that you have not claimed you have not claimed anything. So the capital allowances that are available to you are 65,000. Therefore, you calculate 25% of 65,000 give you 650, giving you a balance of 4750. So what when you add your capital allowances and charges there, it works out to be 17,250. So this is the amount that you want to charge against your profits for the particular tax year. Remember, this presentation was made to introduce you to a better presentation so that you can move faster in exams, you know, because experience shows us that when it is a mixture in your capital structure, people get confused when calculating this capital. This, I suppose, will minimize your complications. Now, this takes us to business profit computations as a difficult area. In this case, candidates normally are unable to properly calculate and deal with the uh, adjustment procedure, difficulty in dealing with the capital allowances, which must be backed up by what I've said on capital allowances, and also difficulty in accounting for investment income, whether it is gross or net receipt. Now, right, uh, the major difficulty in business profit computations relates to adjustments, which I'm suggesting that must be done preferably side by side for examination purposes and the in the interest of time. Uh, this being the case, I'd like us to look at uh, a simple example of a past exam relating to Pure Fruit, a Zambian resident company, producing prejuice from a variety of fruits supplied by its own extensive agricultural operations. And the company listed its shares on the Lusaka Stock Exchange in 2016, when 25% of issues, issued shares were taken up by indigenous Zambians. For the purposes of income taxes, Pure Fruit is classified as a company engaged in farming. So what we are looking at here is a farming organization where the tax rate that would be applicable normally is 10% instead of 35%. Now this company made a net profit before tax as per statement of profit or loss amounting to 251,700 for the tax ended December 18. This profit figure was arrived at after the following. Now, other income. There was a profit on sale of a piece of farmland amounting to 40,000 kwacha. The farmland was acquired three years ago at a cost of 200,000 kwacha. And the sale proceeds were 240,000, while the more open market value was 260,000 kwacha. Investment income amounting to 80,000 includes royalties amounting to 60,000, that is gross, and the rental income amounting to 20,000, again, which is gross. Withholding tax has already been deducted at source in each case. Now, when it comes to expenses relating to this company, does depreciation of non-current assets of 106,700, impairment losses arising from intangible assets of 41,500, and then we, there were irrecoverable debts uh, and uh, expenses of 230,000, which included trade debts written off of 170, increase in general provision of 85, increase in specific provision of 40,000, trade debts previously written off, now recovered 50,000, and loans to former employees previously written off, now recovered of 15,000. Wages and salaries, quite 882,600, which includes directors' emoluments amounting to 308,000, quite 400. These directors are accommodated in company-owned houses. Uh, professional 
and legal fees of 370 includes 80,000 for collection of trade dates, 130 for accountancy, audit fees, 52,000 for recovery of loans from former employee, 38,000 quarter penalty for late payment of balance of income tax for the tax year 2017, and 70,000 for defending title to company's farmland. Entertainment expenses of 180,000, which included 61,000 entertainment suppliers, 48,000 entertainment of customers, and the balance was incurred into entertaining employees. Now, when it comes to general expenses of 1786,800, this included distribution expenses of 790,700, administration expenses of 581,000, canteen expenses. Uh, incurred in providing meals to members of staff, 241,000, and gifts of calendar bearing the company's name, each costing 97 kwacha, amounting to 174,100. Now, other information given in relation to this is that the capital allowances were calculated and claimed during the year, amounting to 415,750, meaning that there would be no need to have a, a capital allowances schedule here because the capital allowances had already been calculated. And secondly, provisional income tax paid by the company for the tax at 20 amounted to 59,137. Now, the requirement in this question was uh, for candidates to calculate the adjusted profits for the farm for the tax year 2018. Now, you will note that when it comes to calculating adjusted business profits, you, you pick the profits as reported in the accounts before tax, and then you make adjustments. I've just suggested in this presentation that it is for time management sake Let's have our adjustments side by side so that as you read the question, you don't have to wait to first deal with the pluses, the ones you're adding back first, and then later on you look for the ones that you're going to be subtracting. Time will not allow you in the exams. So as you go through the question, pick those which you think you must add back, those which you must subtract, and so on up to the ends, like what I've done here. You can see I've got 251,700, which was reported profit before tax. And then I'm adding back depreciation of 106,700. And then I'm subtracting the capital allowances, which they say must be allowed. And then I'm going to impairment loss. You see, impairment loss is a capital item, so it's not allowed for tax purposes. And the profit on sale of land, again, is, is a capital nature. In fact, it will be subjected to property transfer tax. Royalties, you deduct because royalties is not a business profit. Rental income subtract is not a business profit. Loans to former employees is not allowable for tax purposes. Increase in provision. Now, you see, in provision, it must be increase in provision. General provision is not allowed. If this was specific, it was going to be allowed. Penalty for late payment of tax is not allowable. And the continuing expenses, unfortunately, for employees are also not allowable. And the free accommodation. Now, when you provide free accommodation to your directors, there's a taxable benefit, not to the employee, but to the company, which is the one that is coming in here as 92,250. And again, if you provide a personal to hold a car to your directors, there's a taxable benefit on the company, not on the employee, which must be taxed. And this is again in the tax tables. Entertainment of suppliers, which I alluded to earlier, is not allowable for tax purposes. Entertainment of customers is not allowable. But for employees, yes, it is, so it doesn't come into the adjustments. So here now, you add all your pluses you add all your minuses, get a net figure, and either add it or subtract it. In this case, we're adding it to the profit that was reported to get the adjusted 
farming business profits. This would normally take us now to bring in the investment income to the farm and at gross rates and then compute tax because this is a farm now we are saying it will be 10% but there's an issue now of them having been listed on the stock exchange and having offered some shares to indigenous Zambians which would also apply. Now having said that this takes us to the last item on this presentation, which is the general examination technique, which is really related to three aspects. Time management, understanding of the requirements, and the legibility of presentation of the answers. Now, when it comes to time management, DA10 taxation examination has got two parts. Part A has got two compulsory questions of 25 marks, which is 50 marks. And then Part B has got three questions of 25 marks each, out of which candidates are required to attempt any two questions of their choice. In this case, candidates are advised to allocate 45 minutes to each attempted question. This will assist candidates to complete the examination in the time that is allowed. And the, to go with that, please, it is advisable to pick the, the question that you think is the simplest to you as a kickoff. Then you can pick the other selections later. When a question, which is supposed to take 45 minutes, uh, is taking you, let's say, 50 minutes, drop it, go to the next question. If again, same thing, drop it, go to the question, so that at least you are able to attempt all the questions. That way, you should be able to get good marks. Secondly, you must understand, take the trouble to understand the requirements. The requirements, normally they've got verbs which indicate what is required. Read, understand, and interpret the content and requirements for all questions to identify the part of the syllabus being examined, and then choose questions where you feel more comfortable. In fact, start with a more comf a question where you are more comfortable, as I said. And you can do this by underlying the action verbs diligently, which will ensure that you answer the question that is in front of you. 
not the question that you think is in front of you. Now, when it comes to legible presentation of answers, you know, it's just logic that answers should be presented in a legible handwriting and in a proper format. I try to adapt the standard way of presenting computation answers. In the process, it is advisable not to be verbose. In other words, don't talk too much. Stick to the question. As I said, when it comes to capital allowances, I've suggested how you can probably minimize time wasting by presenting your answer in a certain fashion. When it comes to VAT computations, I've suggested that you must present your answer by looking at output VAT, input VAT. As you read the question, you don't wait to deal with part one part only first. Now, this marks the end of my presentation, and I would like to thank you all for your presence.